Um, we're having a discussion today about African American barbecuers, where we'll focus mainly on the work of Andrian, Adrian sorry, Miller with um, his 2021 book, Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbecue. Before I introduce our guests, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am a journalism professor at SMU. I'm also the director of the Center for Teaching Excellence. I wouldn't call myself a chef or a pit master by any stretch of the imagination, but my baby brother is, and he has coached me through many kinds of uh, eating events. He does our family reunion all the time. And so what I do do well is eat and think about the connection to history and family with food. So I'm really, really thrilled to be doing this. So let's get to our guests. The first one is Jose Rallat. He's a Texas monthly taco editor. I should have warned you, each of these folks have jobs that are so enviable, you'll want to sign up and, and do this yourselves. <laughs> Um, he writes about tacos and Mexican food. There's a connection, I think, culturally to how barbecue works, so we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into that. He's also the author of American Tacos, a History, a History and Guide. He's written for Eater, Imbib, Dallas Observer, D Magazine, Vice, Cow Cowboys and Indians Magazine. How cool is that? What is that? So anyway. It's a Western lifestyle magazine, oh. and I was their food guy. <laughs> okay, that's cool. And gravy and other national and regional online and media um, print outlets. Jose is also a member of the National Association of uh, Hispanic Journalists and serves on the advisory board of Foodways Texas. Next, I'd like to introduce Brett Reeves. Brett Reeves and his brother Juan own Smokey John's Barbecue and Home Cooking. Those of us from here, I think most of us know Smokey John's, at least I do. <laughs> Um, it's black-owned, family-owned, and well-celebrated and appreciated restaurant here in Dallas. The restaurant was opened by their dad in 1976. Brent has done it all in the food industry. Wow, it's kind of hard to talk here. It is loud. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. From busing tables to running large catering operations. He's also competed in several culinary competitions, including being the winner of Destination America's Deep Fried Masters with his signature Deep Fried Reese. You have to tell me what that is. <laughs> and winner of the Cooking Channel's Carnival Kings, winner of the Food Network's Family Restaurant Rivals Competition, and two-time winner of the State Fair of Texas Big Tex Choice Awards. He had big red chicken bread and fried jello. Brent and Juan have launched a special restaurant series titled What's for Lunch? which has been featured on CW33 and WFAA. And now they both are part of the cast of Amy's new TV show called Deep Fried Dynasty, which some has described as a love letter to the State Fair. The Rees family is also very committed to the community, so I'd like to sort of touch on that as well. And then last but not least, our food historian, Adrian Miller. Adrian Miller is a James Beard award-winning author, a culinary historian whose work spans the history of soul food, barbecue, as well as the social and political impact of African Americans who worked in the presidential food service. He also calls himself a recovering lawyer and has worked <laughs> at the Clinton White House and served as a senior policy analyst in Colorado Governor Bill Ritter's administration. I have to say, though, one of the coolest titles that he holds is that he is a certified Kansas City Barbecue Society judge. I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't pull out all the right pages here. He's won numerous awards for his work, including the 12th Annual Literary Award bestowed upon him last night at the Friends of SMU Library's Annual Tables of Content fundraiser. I missed it. But I understand that his mother's banana pudding was served. I'm sure that was a first. Yep. <laughs> his latest work is Black Smoke. It's an amazing deep dive that is infused with humor, history, and the stories of many unsung heroes of the pit. Adrian literally ate his way across America as part of his research. Where do we sign up for that job? <laughs> right. I could do that one. Um, there's so much more that I, I can say, but I think it's time for you to go ahead and take the mantle, and why don't you start us off? All right. Um, so good to see you all this morning. 
Uh, again, Adrian Miller, I'm the soul food scholar. My tagline is dropping knowledge like hot biscuits. So we're gonna do that this morning. <laughs> Uh, so the reason why I wrote Black Smoke is um, I was just tired of white dudes getting all the credit when it came to barbecue. Because when I was watching TV shows, reading magazines and all these things, it was just white dude after white dude. And I think the pivotal moment for me was in 2004, I was watching the Food Network and there was Paula Deen's, uh, there was a commercial for Paula Deen's Southern Barbecue. So I was working on my soul food book, but I figured I was going to write about barbecue eventually in its own book because... Originally, the soul food book was going to have a chapter on barbecue because so many black-owned uh, barbecue joints have soul food sides and so many soul food restaurants have barbecue on the menu. Uh, but then I found so much information. I said, this really needs its own treatment. So I'm working on my soul food book, but I knew that I was going to write about barbecue. And so I said, well, let me just watch this show. I can see the latest trends, find out who the leading lights are. 60 minutes later, when the credits were rolling, not one African-American was featured on that show. So I'm sitting here, first of all, thinking, well, how does that happen? And then I thought, well, maybe I got it twisted. Maybe it was Paula Deen's Scandinavian barbecue, and I just <laughs> didn't pay attention to the commercial. So um, I started looking, and then it wasn't just Paula Deen's show. I mean, I just looked at various media, and I found that. And, and what's interesting is that was not the case. For 200 years, uh, African Americans were the go-to cooks in barbecue. In fact, if you read any media, on barbecue or consumed any media on barbecue, it would have been weird not to feature African Americans. And this all starts to change in the 1990s. We have this group called Foodies. I'm one of them. I'm one of those cats who takes pictures of my food, you know. Uh, so this group emerges that's very curious about food, um, its backstory, and they started intense interest in barbecue. Now, barbecue had always been popular, but its, its interest skyrocketed in the 90s. And at the very time that foodies were looking and asking two questions, what is this thing called barbecue and where do I get the good stuff? The media that was catering to this group was pretty much focused on white guys. And I think it's because it was white dominated media and when they were looking for stories, they just talked to their networks. And if their networks weren't diverse, you know, that skewed the coverage. And so I believe that four types of white dudes are the ones who get featured in barbecue. So first of all, you've got the Bubba type, right? The rural working class guy. You've got the uh, competition, barbecue circuit guy. Uh, and then you've got what I call the urban hipster, right? Interesting facial hair, glasses, tattoos, piercings, you know. The, you know. Um, and then what I call tokes who smoke. So these are the fine dining chefs who are in barbecue in ways that they weren't before. I mean, the idea that Bobby Flay is like a go-to barbecue guy is, you know, it just typifies kind of the coverage. And so um, because of that, for the last... Um, 20 years, we've just had a skewed coverage. And so African-Americans have either been minimized in their role in barbecue or left out completely. And um, interestingly, barbecue is going all around the world. I was just in the Middle East. People are going nuts for African-American, or not African-American, sorry, barbecue, um, because of what they're getting. They're in um, places like Cairo and Dubai. I went to a place in Cairo called Longhorn Barbecue. So they had some guy from Texas come out there for six months and teach them how to make barbecue. And he knew I was coming. Uh, when I get to the restaurant, there's a giant bronze steer. Everything is in English. They have saddles for seating. They have a market look. Uh, and he opens the door and he says, welcome to Texas. So um, you know, one thing I wanted to show is just to reorient the barbecue story and just show, look, if you're going to talk about barbecue in the United States, you have to include African Americans. So it really is a celebration of African American barbecue culture and um, using stories to re reorient the narrative. And the way I wrote the book is uh, it's thematic. So I talk about different aspects of African-American barbecue culture. And then um, the chapters feature vignettes of somebody in history who was known for barbecue. And I'll just share one um, that was really fascinating to me. You know, barbecue is always presented as dude food, right? Uh, and so I found this story of a woman named Marie Jean, French of uh, Arkansas, when she was born when Arkansas was French territory, then Mary, Mary John would be the anglicized name. There's this story, July 1st, 1840, um, July 4th, 1840, of her superintending a barbecue in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Superintending was the 19th century word for pitmaster. So we've got this, and she was enslaved. So we've got this enslaved woman Running barbecue. I know, sister, right? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I can see your face. Even with the mask on, I can see your expression. <laughs> Running this barbecue. And she ends up being hired out to do barbecues up and down um, Arkansas River. She ends up 
making enough money to buy her freedom. Hmm. And she runs a restaurant in, um, it's called the Arkansas Post. She runs a restaurant, and then in 1850, the white newspaper eulogizes her like they would any chef. Now, there was some racism mixed into it. I mean, it was 1850. But um, the fact that this uh, black woman was called out was pretty impressive. So uh, it just shows the deep legacy of African Americans in barbecue and African American women, and that sisters have been grilling it for themselves for a long time. So that's just <laughs> one, one example. So I'll leave it there because I want to get into discussion. Sure, so. sure. So what, where, let's start at the beginning, because most of us assume that barbecue was started by African Americans. And your book dispels that. So don't you hate it when the facts don't quite match up to? Uh, yeah, not only do I hate it, but a lot of other people hate it. So, <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, when I, when I started this, because I know about the rich history of African Americans in barbecue, I thought I was going to be able to prove without a doubt that there was an African, Ameri uh, African origin to barbecue. I wanted to cross, you know, do this Wakanda forever. <laughs> um, but, you know, what the research has shown me is that it's really Native American in its foundation. And it's later the interplay of enslaved Africans and Europeans that put us on this road to something called Southern Pit Barbecue. Uh, and because when you look at, we don't, and here's the challenge: there are three main players here, right? We've got Europeans, we've got Indigenous people in the Americas, and enslaved Africans. And only one of those groups of people had a literate tradition in the sense that they were writing down stuff. We're dealing with oral history, so it's hard to understand what was happening. So. I know one limitation of my research is that I'm relying on European sources, and that can be fraught with peril. But when we um, look at written accounts of what Africans were, how they were cooking and doing other things at the time of European contact, we don't see anything that we can really call barbecue. They had smoking traditions for fish and other things, but it was more similar to what people were doing in Europe in the sense that they had a mud house, you had a source of smoke, and then they would hang fish and other things. So we don't really see pit barbecue. So I argue that it's Nat Native American in foundation, and then later um, the interplay of these other groups put us, leads us to Southern barbecue. But because barbecue in its earliest iteration was hard work, enslaved Africans and later enslaved African Americans were the ones forced to do this work, mm -hmm. and then they become barbecue's go-to cooks. In fact, throughout the late 18th century and the 19th century, you have newspaper articles all over the place basically saying, if you want legit barbecue, you have an, uh, an, an African American cook it. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the most disturbing and horrifying aspects of this is when you linked barbecue to some of the torturing techniques used by the slave masters. Would you just speak briefly about that? Because it really made my jaw drop. Yeah, the that was connection. One... I never did that before. Right. There's three things. So um, if if lynching involved barbecue or fire, they would call it a barbecue. And so the term Negro barbecue meant, in, in some, many instances, lynching, uh, which is horrifying. Also, you had uh, slaveholders and overseers that they wanted to inflict the most sadistic punishment. Sometimes they would make barbecue sauce. And the earliest barbecue sauce was vinegar and red pepper. So after lashing somebody on the back, whipping them, they would pour that mixture over the back just to add more, inflict more pain. Mm -hmm. And then we have a couple of instances, including an um, enslaved woman who was pregnant, where they essentially cooked them over a pit. So dug a pit, had the hardwood burning coals, and then tortured uh, these people over that. So um, it was rough to write about that, but I wanted yeah. people to have a fuller context for barbecue uh, in the antebellum South and what it was like. And then you know, with the lynchings, that happened after that. So, right. Yeah. There's so little written about this. How did you go about this kind of research? Because that's very hard to sort of find narratives about. And so um, my research relied really on oral histories mm -hmm. of enslaved people, and um, mainly the Federal Writers Project in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. I looked through all of those. So those are 3,500 interviews. Mm -hmm. And so I, I indexed every reference to barbecue I could find. And that's where I found these stories of the torture. Oh, yeah. There, um, but the rest of it, I heavily relied on newspapers. Um, newspapers were about chronicling the daily life of their community, and so a lot of these um, newspapers wrote about uh, African American cooks uh, who were doing barbecue. And what's interesting is, in the first part of the 19th century, you only got maybe uh, one or two stray references. They they mm -hmm. they accounted for the fact that enslaved uh, people were cooking, but you didn't get much more information. Mm -hmm. But as the 19th century progresses, you actually see journalists interviewing 
mm -hmm. African Americans are doing the cooking. So we get more into the mind mm -hmm. of these cooks and we figure out how they approached making barbecue and we get a lot more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's an impressive thing because of the logistics, you gotta you know, find the clearing, you gotta dig the trench, you gotta chop the wood, burn down mm -hmm. the coals, get the animals, butcher them, process them, mm -hmm. put poles in them, somebody's gotta flip that meat periodically, somebody's gotta sauce it, and then you've gotta have the logistics of serving this. And we have accounts of barbecues for 10,000, 25,000. Right. And the largest barbecue happened in Oklahoma in 1921 was uh, reportedly 100,000 people. Now, we don't know if those numbers are accurate because we didn't have Google satellite technology back then, but <laughs> we know that they were big deals. And so logistically, to pull all of that off is just, it's quite the feat. Yeah, that is quite the feat. Um, one other question sort of about this time period, it's also taking a look at barbecue as a source of revolt yeah. and resistance. And I think we see this all the way through, even now that food is still an essential part of social justice yeah. and how we move forward and how we strategize and what we do around food. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit how that worked during slavery? And then we'll move more into the... Okay, yeah, so three points. So one is um, in, the, in, the, in the life of enslaved people, there were certain times when the work schedule slowed on the weekends and on, on holidays. And so that's when people would do barbecue because it takes a while to do that. And so what we know now is that a lot of the almost near successful slave revolts were actually planned during barbecues. Um, Denmark VC, Nat Turner, um, other things. So it got to the point where actually white newspaper editorialists were saying, you gotta stop black people from barbecuing <laughs> because they're gonna, you know, they hatch these plans. Um, also, we find out later that at the time of the Civil War, there were a lot of African-American barbecuers that just crossed the, you know, crossed into Union territory and started cooking and barbecuing uh, for uh, Union soldiers as a, a, a means of sustenance. So I, I write in the book, you know, thank mm -hmm. you for your service. We're glad you did that. Um, and then the other thing I want to note is, uh, you remember a few years ago in Oakland where you had the people that were grilling in the park supposedly illegally and the mm -hmm. person called them in. And then in response to that, you had the community just turn out for a, you know, a really big kind of barbecue block party. And to me, that was a, another form of resistance to you know this idea that we can be surveyed, we as African Americans, no mm -hmm. matter what we do. So yeah, there's a common theme of just kind of barbecue and resistance. Mm -hmm. Brent, you want to jump in on that as well because with your shoebox lunches and the, that's kind of touching on that, right? Yeah, you know, so one of our core values for our company is education, mm -hmm. and so one of the things we think is it's a it's a cool way to be able to educate people with food. Mm -hmm. um, food seems to be the center point of so many different things. Even um, you see these world leaders that are going to meet. Well, they sit at a table, you know, mm -hmm. with a meal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and, and they could be adversaries, not like each other, but mm -hmm. foods involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so, my brother and I really thought that food could be a way to open uh, minds mm -hmm. uh, to, to be uh, vulnerable to, to hear stories. And so one of the things we found out about was the shoebox lunch. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we didn't know that years ago um, when black people may get shoes, sometimes you would even get a shoebox, sometimes they didn't get shoeboxes. But when they got a shoebox, they would keep it and like just really covet that shoebox, right? And so when they travel down south, what they would do is use that shoebox to pack their lunches. Mm -hmm. um, because during Jim Crow era, you know, really couldn't go to certain restaurants. Right. And so mm -hmm. you just had to be prepared. So you just pack your lunch in a shoebox. And a lot of times it was like fried chicken, uh, sweet potato pie, things that you could carry that uh, really wouldn't be affected by temperature, mm -hmm. um, sandwiches, things like that. Um, and so my brother and I were like, man, that's a really cool, cool thing. Can we do this for Black History Month? Can we educate people? And so we created the shoebox lunch. Mm -hmm. And so we created these opportunities for people to come in, buy a lunch, and we actually bought shoeboxes and put the lunch in shoeboxes so that you would get the exact feel of what it was like for people to carry those. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the response was ridiculous. Um, we had so many people. That the interesting thing for us was people were coming in um, older uh, African Americans coming in and going, oh my God, like I haven't done this in oh, 60 they years. They remembered it. Yeah. And they would, so we yeah. had uh, we had Native Americans that were coming in. I remember this lady, she was about 85, came in, uh, 
older Native American woman, and she sat in the line and cried. And we were, we were like, are, are you okay? What, what's going on? She's like, my people went through this as well. Mm-hmm. We, this is, we had to take shoeboxes. Mm-hmm. And she just sat in line and just teared up and cried. And, <clears throat> and so we're like having this moment. And, you know, my brother and I, we're just like, we're just thinking it's just education. But this is striking a chord. Mm-hmm. And there were people that were flying in because we're right by Love Field. So they're flying in from Mississippi, Alabama. They're just coming to eat. And they see this story. And they're like, they're just sitting in, I, I can't, like, it was so crazy to see people at their tables just sitting there looking at the box. That's beautiful. And they just were remembering exactly, they remember the stories their grandparents told them about it. Mm-hmm. And they remember that. One lady said she still has the box, and, and she kept it from her grandmother. Mm-hmm. And so when she got this, they some people are taking them home, and they put them on their um, on the fireplace. And so, you know, something we just thought was a very interesting story that would be great for people to know, we didn't realize how what kind of a chord that this would strike. Mm-hmm. But food can be educational. Yeah. Can we get just a quick breakdown of what's typically in one of the boxes? Um, So usually it's uh, fried chicken or some type of fruit, uh, generally sweet potato pie or some type of cookie uh, type item that can just travel well. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And then and and then boiled eggs were usually in there because you could have those for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what we did was we did sweet potato pies, fried chicken, and we had a lot of VISD uh, that would actually cater these. And so we had, we also put the story inside the box and on top of the box okay. so that people could understand exactly what, you know, like, why, why a sweet potato pie, you know? Well, because it, you can leave it out and you're going to be okay, you know? So that's, there were different things that people put in there, but more so like bananas, apples, oranges, mm-hmm. all those uh, specific fruits would be in there as well. So, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. Jose, you want to talk a little bit about the community of food? Because I think tacos really plays into that as well. Yeah, so I say, like what what these gentlemen have said is that um, this food is a force for good. And I say a lot. Tacos are a force for good. and Nothing reaches its full potential until it gets into a tortilla. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you think about it, right now, what, what is the easiest way for immigrants or people of color to popularize their food? Put it in a taco. And you'll see it again and again and again. Uh, one of those things is barbacoa, mm-hmm. which uh, Adrian does a great job of looking at uh, and I happen to come from that part of the world. I'm Puerto Rican. We invented barbacoa. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's where we get the word barbecue. But uh, barbacoa, just like barbecue, just like any big feast, that's an event. It requires people to get together and divvy up the labor. That requires digging a hole. That, That requires breaking down the meat. And uh, everyone's got a job, and then you sit around and wait, Mm -hmm. drinking a beer. And what does beer do? Loosens lips. And everyone gets together, (laughs) right, and they talk. Uh, And uh, Brett did the manas for the fair. that's another bridge between mm-hmm. the African and Latino mm-hmm. community and how uh, there are a lot more connections mm-hmm. than we 
realized. And, yeah. and at that at this point, can we can we find out what African Americans came through the Caribbean basin? Right? Because so there's yeah. lots of mestizaje. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mestizaje and mm -hmm. Caribbean people are mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, but that food uh, eventually just becomes all of our food. It doesn't become all of our struggle because I don't know what it's like to be black. I can never know that. But I can know what it's like to have community built around food, even though it takes forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one of the cool things that's happened in the last few years is there's much more documentation mm -hmm. of where people came from and stuff. So I actually have a book on the way. There's an atlas of the Atlantic um, slave trade that's supposed to really oh, uh, wow. pinpoint us. So I'm looking forward to that resource. Yeah. So yeah. We can find out more, and I think food tells a story, right? And it's interesting to follow people yeah. and see how their food changes. Yeah, because you mentioned human in your food, and um, that was brought by Canary Islanders through Mexico up to Texas, and cumin is in everything these days, oh, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. yeah, we use cumin, cumin um, paprika. Um, there's so many flavors um, that you see that are connecting and bridging cultures. You know, mm -hmm. and it's just, you know, we just grab it off the shelf. We don't know why, but there's a there's something that when that flavor hits your palate that that makes you think of home. You know, and and the, the idea that maybe that same flavor makes someone else feel like home. Uh, we get, you know, very have a very diverse uh, clientele that comes in, and we have people that, that sit there and eat. It's like, wow, you know, it's like my grandfather is like, hey, Hispanic. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, but you know, it's all the same flavors, you know. So it's it, it's it's funny how food can bridge uh, culture. But brother Brent, don't you know that barbecue should only be salt and pepper and unsauced? <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, that's it, what true barbecue is now. It just shouldn't be, you know. Uh, it needs to be a lot of flavor, you know? And that, you know, yeah. especially our people, we do flavor, man. We, you know, I know, right? You know, we do flavor. And if, if, if yeah. you don't have flavor, it's just like, wait, what, what, what is this? <laughs> you know, and we all know you, you, you go to a certain restaurant, if we walk in and we try it and it's bland, we, <laughs> yeah. you, you look at your mama, you look yeah. at the so why are we here? What, what is this, you know? Right. And so it's, it's an issue. It's like, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's it's part of the culture. If that don't taste like nothing, we can, we'll just step up and get out, and we'll probably get a <laughs> refund too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was in college, I went to college in the Carolinas. We had pig pickings regularly on campus. Oh yeah. Oh wow. And we were in the Carolinas. We could just drive into the country and mm. eat. Yep. I, I didn't see any white pitmasters. Yep. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> that's why it's so weird just to see that, you know, the barbecue media just mm -hmm. focuses, you know, without having people of color involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's weird. That kind of brings me to your sauce chapter, which to me was like, I wish I had put on some jazz as I was reading it, because the idea of taking a base kind of sauce with some vinegar and some red pepper and some cayenne and stuff, and then you start riffing, right? Yep. That's what sauce is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. a little tomato in there, sometimes not. You know, sometimes it's a brown gravy. So talk a little bit about that. So that's now one of the biggest dividing lines in barbecue, mm -hmm. especially from an African American aesthetic. Because uh, you know, the emerging narrative is that barbecue should be minimally seasoned. You know, mm -hmm. the, the smoke is the emphasis, and it should be in sauce because you're hiding something. If you, and I'm like, says who? Because <laughs> Most of the, I mean, I've eaten my way through the country. I've gone to the 200 barbecue joints across the country. Most African-American joints are going to have sauce. And in fact, the sauce is the calling card because it's actually the opposite. People assume that you know how to cook the meat. Mm -hmm. And so the sauce is the calling card. And I've been to places where my plate arrives and it's an ocean of sauce with little islands of meat poking through. Mm -hmm. That's how much the sauce mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, 
preeminent. And so I go back and I look at the mother sauce for barbecue was this vinegar with red pepper. Mm -hmm. And then eventually people accepted tomato because in the early days they didn't because tomatoes are part of the nightshade family botanically. Mm -hmm. um, and so people thought it was poisonous. So it would, took some time to embrace tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all kinds of um, different riffs. And, uh, you know, for instance, in Georgia, northern Florida, South Carolina, I mean, I'm a fan of the mustard sauce mm -hmm. that's evolved as, mm -hmm. there as well. So it's been interesting to see how that play off. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, yeah, you know, I, of course I've had barbecue unsauced, and it's good, mm -hmm. but I like sauce as well. So I really wanted to show how... Uh, African-Americans embrace sauce and how that became a calling card. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I think it's a, it's a signature of African-American barbecue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's do, so funny. You do sauces? Oh, we do. We do sauce, <laughs> yeah. It's funny because I'm, I'm listening to you, especially when you're talking about jazz. So uh -huh. part of my dad, you know, so he's, he started the restaurant in 1976. And so uh, his big issue was his sauce and really trying to figure out how to get that down. So the, the problem with my dad is that not problem, but the issue is that he would he cooks to feel, right? You know, and it's like he's feeling. Come on, <laughs> he's feeling it. Boom, you know, it's gonna be <laughs> cayenne and tomato sauce, and it's you know, so he couldn't make the same sauce every day. It's like it's uh, just okay, you know, yeah. and, and he was never a recipe chef or cook, uh, you know, so he just would throw stuff in, and so my mom was like, okay, this one is good. Stop! Don't do anything. <laughs> Write it down. And so, so the last time he made it, she was like, okay, don't, you don't touch nothing until I get my pen. You know, so finally he was, she was like writing down all these different things. And, and, whether, and this is the key. The interesting thing about our barbecue is I think people like it because we're a mix between the Carolinas, Texas, and Memphis style. Oh, yeah. Our flavor is a bit of all of it. Okay. Because he used to go to all these places. And then he's like, oh, that tastes good. Oh, that tastes good. So when he actually made the sauce, it actually tastes like all these places. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't realize that. I was like, man, that's going to be our biggest selling point now. Yeah. Um, and so, but he, he, his feel was just, he put himself into the sauce. Just like if a guy is on a, on a guitar, he, exactly. he did the same thing with the right. sauce. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, of the, um, one of my best finds for my book is I have an editorial cartoon. So there's a guy named Arthur Bryant famous barbecue guy in Kansas City. He dies in 1982, and the local newspaper put, printed an editorial cartoon. So it's uh, Arthur Bryant about mm -hmm. to enter the pearly gates. St. Peter has his arm around him, and the question he asks him is, did you bring the sauce? <laughs> <laughs> That's priceless. Talk, talk a little bit about the, the different um, regions and barbecue and what that means as well. You were talking earlier about Central Texas and how this has sort of really caught on and has become so popular while there is just like so many other ways you can go as well. So Yeah, so just just quick survey. So you've got, uh, you know, barbecue, I argue, started in Virginia. That's the first interplay of, of enslaved Africans, Europeans, and Native Americans. But for whatever reason, Virginia has not claimed its birthright. So now... The type of whole hog barbecue that exists, and, and I should say in the early years of barbecue, it wasn't just hogs. It could be any animal could show up. Um, you know, we now associate that with eastern North Carolina um, and with the vinegar sauce. So you've got the Carolinas, and I'm lumping them together. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, pork dominated, so whole hogs and also pork shoulder. Mm -hmm. Then I think there's a deep south style, which is more ribs, pork shoulder, chicken, mm -hmm. uh, more of a thin, sweet sauce, tomato, mm -hmm. uh, tomato -y, and then southern sides. Um, and you've got Memphis, which I think is barbecue's funky town, because there's mm -hmm. all kinds of interesting stuff. There's like mm -hmm. barbecue spaghetti, barbecue mm -hmm. pizza, uh, in addition to ribs. Um, and then you, in Kentucky, there's a micro tradition of just uh, of mutton mm -hmm. with Worcestershire sauce. Uh, and then I think Southside Chicago should get some love. It, I think it has a distinctive style. Mm -hmm. it, nobody yeah, talks true. about it, yeah, right? Yeah. Very but true. it's rib tips, uh, mm -hmm. hot links, and chicken. Um, and then you've got Kansas City, Missouri, you know, kind of like a, a medley of things because of their agricultural centers and a lot of traffic. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to Texas, I think there are three styles. Um, people talk about Central Texas, do brisket dominant, and sausages. But East Texas, the early accounts, earliest written accounts that we have of barbecue are enslaved people coming to East Texas doing barbecue in the 1820s and 30s. Um, and a Creole influence, so a lot of influence from uh, Louisiana. So you've got brisket, ribs, and 
sausage and everything, but then you've got boudin, so mm -hmm. you, uh, spelled with an mm -hmm. A, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Um, and you know, so a lot of the same things in common with Central Texas, but a different presentation. So instead of this perfectly manicured, Instagrammable mm -hmm. slices of brisket, you know, it might be mm -hmm. chopped up with sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, and then South Texas, you've got the barbacoa tradition, cabeza, cabrito, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. these other things, and people don't really talk about that. When they say Texas barbecue, they immediately go to. But cabrito's expensive, man. Oh, is it now? Oh, it's mm -hmm. like $70 for a plate. Oh, really? Because it's labor wow. intensive. You yeah. have to slaughter it, butcher it, butterfly it, put it on a spit over the mesquite coals, and it takes forever to cook. Wow. Be I didn't because know. it's like three feet above the coals. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the only other kind of small tradition I'll point out is in um, Santa Maria, California, there's a beef fry tip cooked over red oak. Mm -hmm. tradition it's very hyper local mm -hmm. um and then the rest of the country is kind of a mix you know um the typical thing that's happening now is you've got people traveling all around the country tasting different things they'll open up a barbecue joint and they'll cook the meat all the same way right and they'll take highlights from around the country and then they'll have regional sauces mm -hmm. and they'll say oh make this north carolina style by putting this sauce on it yep. and see that just bugs me because especially with carolina barbecue the sauce is not really a condiment. It's a seasoning mm -hmm. that you add throughout the process that gives it a depth of flavor. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, that's kind of how we're, um, barbecue is emerging. But I will say this, um, for the last five, 10 years, most of the new barbecue places that are opening are Central Texas style. That's the dominant style now. Right, why is that? I think it's because uh, Texas has the best cheerleaders. Y'all are just proud of your culture. Right. And when you, you say yours is the best, uh, I think it's part of uh, the ascendancy and notoriety of Aaron Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he made the decision not to hide all this stuff. He shows everybody how he cooks. Because mm -hmm. barbecue could be very secretive. Right. And I think by doing that, I call that the kind of the Microsoft approach instead mm -hmm. of Apple. You know, just I'm going to show you all how to do this. Mm -hmm. And he is the most uh, prominent barbecue guy in the world. Because I, I, I've been in, I was in Europe at this party talking to this guy from Brussels, and he's like, yeah, I made a pork shoulder last week. And I said, what? <laughs> and he pulls out his phone. He said, yeah, I was watching Aaron Franklin's videos, and wow. I made this, oh, and it wow. was beautiful. <laughs> so I think that, and then Daniel Vaughn is the most influential barbecue writer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a confluence of that, and then barbecue pit masters, and all of these things. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, Texas has the best cheerleader. I personally think that's why Juneteenth is a federal holiday. Because there because were because of the barbecue. No, because Texans are the best cheerleaders. Oh, because I, yeah. oh, I got you. And, and the, bar, <laughs> the barbecue comes with it, yeah. but you know, no, it does. if you go back to emancipation history, yeah. there were multiple emancipation celebrations around the country. Right. But Texans would show up in a place like Denver, and they'd say, "Y'all don't have this. We're going to start it." Right. And um, so I, I just think it's really the boosterism of Texans that, and it's delicious too. That helps, right? And you had red yeah. soda with it. Oh yeah, red soda. I'm all about the red soda. <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about churches and um, barbecue in particular, because in a lot of ways, it helped fund things for churches, right? To have the barbecue dinner afterwards or that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit about the community aspects of that and oh. how that is sort of, and then we'll talk a little bit about the business aspects, particularly like restaurant businesses yeah. and where we are now. So one of the thematic chapters in my book is about church barbecue, and I call it burnt offerings, um, because, uh, you know, the barbecue's been distracting to my spiritual life. I don't know about y'all, but every no, time... you made me laugh out loud. I'm sitting on a plane reading this about the burning bush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, every, whenever I um, read in the Bible about burnt offerings, I think about barbecue, the story of Moses and the burning bush. You know, did it smell like hickory or oak? You know. Um, but so we find that even um, during slavery, enslaved communities, again, because the work schedule would slow on the weekends and holidays, that was the time to make barbecue. And what we found is that um, coupled with spiritual practice, people would have barbecue after that service. And so, you know, to Jose's point, barbecue builds community. Mm -hmm. And so politicians and preachers were the first leaders to really mm -hmm. figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and so you would have these kind of small scale barbecues on plantations. And then there were things called camp meetings or revivals that were multi-day affairs. And preachers figured out, hey, if I have some good barbecue and people can smell that, you know, that while I'm preaching, we might get a crowd. And, and so that uh, aspect of spiritual practice and barbecue comes out of um, through Reconstruction and after Emancipation. And people brought that with them to other places. And so we find that the church barbecue um, was a, 
important, very important fundraiser, but mm -hmm. it also built community. And I, I can't tell you how many churches were built on barbecue. And one of the most famous ones that has now closed was the barbecue church in Huntsville, mm -hmm. um, which I've been to. And it seems like a lot of these uh, black churches have a side hustle, you know, black pastors have a side hustle of barbecue. Right. And I think it's because of their bifurcational, uh, the nature of what they do. And, and um, I don't know what the connection is between preaching the word of God and smoking meat. But it just, golden calf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it definitely exists, and you know, Texas might be the holy land for that because the most barbecue, mm -hmm. uh, church-related businesses I found in my travels around the country have been in Texas. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about businesses in particular. What made your dad decide to start Smoky John's? How did that come to be? Yeah, so uh, dad was a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm. like. He started a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. He was doing roofing business, construction, mm -hmm. mortgage banking, insurance. Wow. So he had all these businesses going at the same time. Um, and so when he would he would close a loan, or he would complete your roofing job, he would go. He would come to your house to thank you. He would give you a smoked ham or a smoked turkey that he oh. smoked himself. Okay. And so on his <laughs> just his free time, he just enjoyed smoking turkeys and hams. And so. He would drop these hams and turkeys off, and they were like, oh, John, thank you so much. This is so good. And so after a while, he started getting a lot of calls for the turkeys and hams. It, it, not, <laughs> the roof, not, <laughs> not the roof, you know, not, 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 not the roofing or yeah. not closing loans. It's like, yeah. hey, get, let me get another one of those turkeys, you know. <laughs> and so a friend of his came to the house one day, and Dad had about 100 turkeys around the house because he had that many orders. And so he was like, John. Were they alive or dead? No, they were dead. Okay. <laughs> All dead. <laughs> Just checked it. All dead. They're, they're, they're in preparation. Okay. <laughs> so they're all over the house. And so he's like, this guy's like, John, you, you need a restaurant. He was like, okay, well, okay, you know. So he just decided, he's like, okay, he knew nothing about the restaurant industry at all. So there was an older guy, having to be a white guy, <laughs> that he – uh, met and he saw he had a restaurant and so what dad did was he's like can I come over here and just work for free for six months he said I just want to just want to see what you're doing and the guy was like okay so dad would have a three-piece suit on <laughs> and he would take coveralls you remember the old school coveralls because he would still have to close his loans and oh, his <laughs> mortgage he'd have wow. to do all that so four o'clock in the morning he'd get up He'd put coveralls on over his three-piece suit, <laughs> and then he would go work for five hours at the barbecue place, take that off, go put his stuff on, and then he would go to the office, close his deals, and when he would deliver, like, so he would, he still was selling all these turkeys, and so he would deposit the money in the bank, and the lady was like, <laughs> <laughs> what? 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 what are you doing? Your money smells so good. <laughs> He's like... And so he sell turkeys at the bank, you know? <laughs> and so after that, he's like, man, I feel pretty good. So he decided to go ahead and open up a restaurant. So mm -hmm. he opened up a restaurant, and the restaurant was called Big John's Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, opened the first week, and the first week, week of business, the pit caught on fire. Oh, mm. no. And it smoked the whole place out. And somebody came to the restaurant and was like, man, this ain't Big John. This is Smokey John's. <laughs> So the next week, Dad took the sign down and put Smokey Johns up, oh, wow. and that's how we that's how we became uh, uh, that's, that's how we got the name Smokey Johns. Yeah, see that sort of um, creativity is really what drives Black Barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. This is how you survive. This is this absolutely. Is how we, yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the business part of this? Because that's this is how businesses pop up. Right. So. Um, we find some of the earliest examples of successful black entrepreneurs in barbecue because it was such a low barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of uh, bar early barbecuers would just have a dig a pit in a rural area. Sometimes they just did it on their front lawn or back lawn. And um, they would just cook a pig and then sell until they ran out. And it was kind of a weekend thing. Um, there were very few people that were doing it every day during the week. But then you get a, a guy like Henry Perry who comes from West Tennessee arrives in Kansas City, mm -hmm. starts selling, he was a porter at first, a hotel porter, but then he starts selling barbecue in an alley mm -hmm. and gets some success and then he has a restaurant. So by the time, in you know, Patillo's in East Texas, mm -hmm. 1910, 1912, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what you, 1912. 
you know, you've got some of the earliest restaurants. You've got Jones and Mariana, Arkansas, mm -hmm. around that same time. So um, I think part of it was it was a low barrier to entry. They had that skill. And African-Americans had a competitive advantage because they had been you know, the dominant uh, mm -hmm. cooks in that market. And um, I don't know if this is racist or not, but the word on the street was, yeah, if you want really good barbecue, go to the go black joint. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, to me, few examples where yeah. you had white people coming into the black part of town mm -hmm. to get barbecue. Now, you didn't see that with soul food and other restaurants as much, but with barbecue. And again, I think that was because of the competitive advantage mm -hmm. and the reputation of black cooks. Mm -hmm. And so um, the thing that has mystified me, though, is why there's never been a national African-American-owned barbecue chain, given the competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Not yet. OK. <laughs> to, to be continued. Right? Right. Working on it. Hey, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're working on it. So that, that's mystified me. The, the closest that I've seen was Gates Barbecue in Kansas City. They have multiple locations mm -hmm. throughout that metropolitan area, right. but not. So I think, I think it's ripe for that. In, in addition to you, there's a guy named Rodney Scott who's doing whole hog barbecue in Charleston, South Carolina. He's got a spot in Birmingham, Alabama, and now Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Interesting story. He's got some money behind him. I don't know if there's a national appetite for whole hog barbecue, but you know, there's a prospect. So I, I think um, it was just uh, it was something that people could do really well, mm -hmm. and um, and you know, but it's labor intensive. And so just like with soul food joints, what you're finding is at certain generational moments, if the kids aren't interested in running that right. place, it just closes. Right. right. You have someone behind you, Brett. Oh yes, man. We're okay. getting ready. <laughs> we're, we're getting ready, and you know I think that's 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 the interesting part for us. I think it's a pride that we have, um, because you know a lot of times you don't see um, black businesses generationally. You mm -hmm. know, uh, and I think that's one of the things my brother and I we're priding ourselves uh, off of is is the next generation. Mm -hmm. You know, is is ownership. You know, and 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 creating uh, legacy. I, the, keeping the le legacy that our dad had going, um, we're the, the, our nieces and nephews, they're already working. They're mm -hmm. learning. You know, they're 9, 10, 16, 15. They're mm -hmm. working in the restaurant. We're not pushing them like they, like, you know, this is what you're going to do, you know. But yeah, yeah. this is an option. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's an, it's an option for you. And I think a lot of times um, um, there have been, been a lot of African-American-owned businesses that have just closed just because mm -hmm. the next generation didn't want it. Yeah, mm -hmm. mostly because it's a lot of work. This is not the industry for like the you know what this Cadillac. You can't Cadillac in the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. It's changing weekly. Yeah, you know? so it's 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 interesting. And then throw the pandemic on oh, top of that. Oh, right. 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 Oh, that, yeah. it's just and and just that. I think the pandemic really exposed um, the issues that the black community is having. Period. I mean, our access to capital is not the mm -hmm. same. You know, trying. Coming with the same concept, with the same um, great following, but you can't get the funds, you yeah. can't get the resources. So mm -hmm. then you can't, you yeah. can't maintain when tragedy or events happen. Right? Mm -hmm. So then that wipes out more African American business. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's just that the pandemic, I think, really shone a light on so many things um, that I feel like now that we we have my, my brother and I had to take a stand. And have to try to be an hopefully to be an example. Like, come on, man, we can do it. We can do this together. So, we, education is why it's such a key. We're putting out information to all of our friends who are restaurant tours. Or, hey, did you did you get this? Did you apply for that? Did you mm -hmm. you know? Just because it's some a lot of times we just don't know. Yep. Not that we can't get it. We just don't know. I mean, yep. we see that with kids with scholarships. Mm -hmm. They're out there. We just don't know. You know. So that's that's, that's really is a push that we have for ourselves. And I, I'm seeing a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Go ahead. I was gonna say I'm I'm seeing a lot of resiliency um, from entrepreneurs now, and they're doing some creative things. You know, we're finding a lot more getting on social media, yeah. having right. vibrant websites. Uh, I want to point out the Jones sisters in Kansas City, Kansas. If y'all mm -hmm. watch Queer Eye, um, the two sisters mm -hmm. from Kansas City, they have a, now a barbecue vending machine. Oh, so a twenty four, yeah, machine. twenty four seven. Oh, wow. You can get your barbecue on. Uh, you can get their sauce and all this other stuff. I think that's just great. oh, so nice. it's like the sprinkle cupcake thing. It just comes yeah. on down. Yep. Out of the <laughs> I just think that's brilliant. That that's is cool. brilliant. That's but, brilliant. But don't you think that barbecue and a lot of Texas traditional cooking, like Mexican food, is kind of made. To survive the pandemic, because we eat differently. Yes. Yeah. We eat to go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We yes. eat standing yes. up. 
No. Mm -hmm. We eat in small, small groups. We can just get up and go. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. so, 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 so taking a shoebox <laughs> works really well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so did you have to struggle and get creative with that oh, kind of thing? Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> like, so... <clears throat> what, so we have three parts of our business, restaurant, catering, and concessions. And we do uh, have several booths at the State Fair of Texas. Um, so one, they were saying that was shutting down. So that's 31% of our annual revenue oh. gone, right? Uh, so we had $75,000 of catering events for March mm. that were all canceled as soon as COVID oh. hit. So we, we lost... And then we lost 55% of sales in two weeks, mm -hmm. just gone. So my brother and I were like, oh, my God. One of the things that we always believe is, that's one thing I always say, is that creativity is always your way out, no matter what. Of whatever you're doing, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're dealing with, I always think that creativity is your way out, right? Um, so one of the things we thought were, we, like, we knew where our market was. They were at home. So we were like, okay. Let's do this. Let's do delivery, a delivery service. All they have to do is have $40 minimum, and we'll deliver it for free. And so we started putting it out, and we, we would, all we asked was that people put their order in the day before and that we would bring your order the next day. And mm -hmm. we give you a window of time. We'll drop it off directly to your doorstep. And so and we got on social media. We start, we were, we're very active on social media. We're doing all this. And we're telling people, hey, look, order your food, order your food. We're going to bring it to you for free, you know. And then we said, we're, and we had regions, Plano, um, DeSoto, Duncanville, Arlington, all these different areas, right? And so we created a competition. Whoever gets the most, we're going to do a prize or whatever. Oh. And so, and no, this is what we told them. If we sold at least 20 deliveries, that we would do something, some stupid karaoke on Facebook Live. So people really wanted to see that. <laughs> so <laughs> we we so that first week we did it, we had over sixty five deliveries in four days, and so it it substituted two days of sales, and mm. so we just kept doing that, and that saved us from the pandemic, mm. say during the time, and then we um, sang some stupid songs. You got, you got to <laughs> tell us what song. You got to give us one of them. So so I. Uh, <laughs> What, so I created a parody. Oh, okay. Uh, off, I, what was the song? It was a, it was a Jodeci song. Oh, so, so instead of fiending for you, I wrote fiending for Q. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so we did a whole song with sunglasses, you know, doing all the <laughs> stupid steps. <laughs> and people thought it was hilarious. And then they started coming in and supporting us. That's awesome. wow. Have you taken this down or is it still up? No, like it's still up. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> it's it's going to be in his next yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to check that out for sure. It's still up. Still up. So yes, creativity was everything. Um, you know, the pandemic was was very tough, but it was we we took it as an opportunity. You know, when we had the fire in 2017, we took that as an opportunity. You know, yeah. and just believed that this is going to be our moment. We just have to take advantage of a bad situation. But I think that's what our people have done mm -hmm. for a number of years mm -hmm. uh, from from the beginning. We it's terrible, and then somehow let me just. Okay, so if anybody is, has, if you guys haven't watched High on the Hog, Adrian is on High mm -hmm. on the Hog. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But they talk about the scraps that people threw, the, you mm -hmm. know, white people threw these things away. Black people took this and turned it into delicacies. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, and, and, and it's, we, we take whatever and we make it amazing. You know, and I think that's just part of the, uh, what the, the fabric of our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, point something out? Thank you for saying that I'm in High on the Hog, because I can't tell you how many people recently have said, I, you know, I watched High on the Hog. Have you heard of it? Oh. I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. No. Like, I've heard a little bit about no. it. A little bit. <laughs> no, so thank you. no, no, you are the expert in I High know. on the Hog. And it's like, man, that was, it was phenomenal, man. That was yeah. great. Well, I think that really shows the future of black barbecue and how I don't see that going anywhere. I mean, we may have an overpopulization right now, media-wise, with white barbecuers, but certainly the future looks bright for the kind of creative 
thinking that you have in terms of your own business. Yeah, and we're already so, seeing some signs. There are some more and more African Americans are getting cookbook deals. Mm -hmm. um, I know of oh, at least great. three people, Af black uh, uh, barbecuers that have cookbook deals coming out. That's great. I'm seeing more representation on TV. And one thing I'm proud about, there's an American Royal Barbecue Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm now on the board, and so is Daniel Vaughn and some others. We've mm -hmm. had more diverse classes, wow. mm -hmm. um, inductee classes. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yes, it's, it's getting better. We got a ways to go, but it's getting better. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think I should stop there so that we can ask a couple of questions. I think we have a couple minutes. Did you have a question? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I timed my chores to Soul Train, so. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things. What's difficult for barbecue and what's difficult to duplicate? Why it's, I think it's a challenge to see it all over the country, like chain barbecue. It's because barbecue is not like fried chicken or chicken sandwiches. You just drop it, pull it up, 15 minutes, you're done. Same thing. Barbecue is so feel. I mean, it's just, there are no two slabs of ribs that are the same. It's just, this one's going to cook for two and a half hours. This one's going to cook for three hours. One of the things we try to share, even with our teammates, is feel. We want them to get involved. So we play a lot of music at the restaurants. When we play like, and I mean, we go from James Brown to uh, Drake to um, Selena, because I'm a big Selena fan, so <laughs> I, got, I gotta have it, right? So we play all this different music, and I want them seasoning to feel. You know, and so like after a while, I don't care if they have their headphones on while they're seasoning the ribs, while they're trimming brisket. They, they just, and so it, because I want it fun. You know, I want it, I don't want this to be labor. You know, I want it to be like, this is a lot of fun. And, you know, and so we get our team and so our team will be there like, ooh, and by, by the time they finish, it's like, oh, it's time to put this on the grill. You know, so, but I think, and even with my niece, nieces and nephews, that we just try to get it to be fun and try to take away that whole, the, the labor of struggle labor out of it and just make it like put yourself into this because I one of the things I share so much with our team is this is soul food. What you feel is going to be in this meat. Mm -hmm. So if you're having a bad attitude, bad, like even my cooks, you got a bad attitude, you need to step out, mm -hmm. shake it off, and then come back because that's going to be in those greens. And I don't want that attitude in those greens. <laughs> And I just, I'm just a real believer in that. You know, I just, it, 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 that feeling comes out. It's just mm -hmm. like when you get in a massage. If you get somebody that really, boy, you can come out of there like, oh, my God, that was great, you know. Or you have somebody with an attitude, and you come out like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel right, you know. Yeah. But barbecue is a feel. And if we can get people to put their emotions and their feelings into it, then I think that you can spread that love and take away that, that, that pain of the struggle. But I mean, given that, don't you think it's dangerous to play Luther or Barry White? It is. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Adrian, you're so right. Because sometimes Jodeci comes on, and I have to stop something. Like, right, right. Oh. Hey, man. Hey, hey, brother. That's just a brisket. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that's just don't a brisket, brisket, brother. Like that. That's what I thought as soon as you said that. That's not fair for your lady. That's hilarious. <laughs> no, sir. Daryl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, so it's going to take some work. So to your point, though, barbecue is definitely about migration. So before the Civil War, barbecue spread with slavery, because enslaved cooks made barbecue happen, um, especially the large-scale barbecues. And you just see it. Wherever slavery spread, barbecue soon, soon shows up. And then after the migration, I, you know, I said that, uh, wrote that uh, African Americans were the most effective barbecue ambassadors because uh, people wanted a taste of Southern barbecue all over the country. So they put black people on trains, stagecoaches, and boats to come in and, you know, kind of come in and do a special event. And um, you have newspaper articles chronicling this all over the place. And then in some instances, you know, the African Americans said, hey, I think I'm going to stay here. And so they started traditions in these places. So yeah, it's definitely tied to migration. And much like Soulful, you can tell where people came from by the barbecue, mm -hmm. how that barbecue is presented in that place, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, so yeah, you're, you're right on about that. And so uh, yeah, there's a lot of challenges in talking about um, Getting people to understand the diversity of barbecue, I think, is the big challenge on this. So I hear you. A book signing. Oh, are we having one? Yeah. I, oh, OK. Oh, do you want to tell people about that? Yes. And if you get my book, I just want to tell you, I offer this to everyone. If you want me to write that I couldn't have written the book without you, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> I, I'm just grateful that you got a book, so. <laughs> That's funny. He also has a list in the back of his favorite barbecue restaurants throughout the country. So you may want to, you may want to take a little peek at that. So um, are we out You're of time? You're giving it away, man, by doing that. <laughs> yeah. He's not giving say. you the special ingredients, though. So, yeah. <laughs> I will say that my book's got a whole chapter on barbecue. Nice. Oh, oh, nice. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're talking about going to a restaurant here or making it at home? Restaurant, okay. Uh, here in Dallas, right? Okay, I'll let the, the Dallas folks play. Ribs. Ribs. Okay. <laughs> Ribs. Ribs and hot links, hostages, uh, breast place. There's also a uh, Smokey Joe's, uh, which has become more central Texas barbecue. Uh, but but the ribs are on point. Uh, none of this overly smoked meat that is also indicative of Central yeah. Texas. Yeah. I don't want a mouth full of smoke. Right. Yeah. I want to taste the meat and the glaze, and you'll find that in ribs. Um, and totally okay, agree. you have another no, place. Oh. No, I, I agree. That just uh, the. The ribs, ribs really tells you to me. Ribs really tell you the flavor of the of the restaurant, um, because usually that flavor is going to kind of permeate through the other things. Um, and if you're doing it right, then it's going to pair well with the sides and other things. And I think that's kind of what I feel like our deal is: is that we don't just our meat's good, but like our sides are really good. You know, it's my grandmother's recipe, some of my own personal recipes. So there's like some feel in it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not just you know, you get two pounds of meat and some beans and something, you know. The same of, uh, attention that you put on 
meat, I think we try to put on sides as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, but th there, are, there are several places here in, in Dallas. If you really want to go old, old school, there's like Records Barbecue. Mm -hmm. And uh, down south, they're still they're still doing it old school, old school style barbecue as well too. And I, Meshack. I, oh, Meshack. Oh, Meshack's, Meshack's, yep. Meshack's Meshack. is good. I, I have a funny story about that. I was going there for the Texas Monthly Top 50 um, research, and there's this really dark window screen uh, between you and the kitchen. That's where you order, and I ask, what kind of wood they use? And I hear this old black man say, pecan. Do you like pecan, boy? And I said, yes, sir, <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. He goes, that's the right answer, man. Like, okay. <laughs> uh, I've also heard good things about a place in Fort Worth called Smokeaholics. I have not been there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't been there. I heard it really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Black-owned yeah. place. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, oh yeah. sure, come on, Sandria. This is Sandria Smith. She put together this whole entire festival.